Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of the Corner Booth. Uh, we're here at the Buchanan Arms. I'm here I'm Luis Escobar. I'm here with Larry Whitaker. And today we're gonna be talking to Dan Haskett. Now uh, Larry, you know Dan a little bit more. Do you want to introduce him? Well, I can as soon as I finish swallowing this. <laughs> I, I totally caught him <laughs> with a big old, right after he uh, had a big bite of his. Uh... <laughs> Dan Haskett and I first met in Nuhunahem <clears throat> during Tiny Tunes. And uh, I won't say what year you guys can internet movie database that to find out. <laughs> I had been in the business for about a month, and I saw these gorgeous drawings, and I had to go find out how to draw that way. So I sought out, <laughs> so I sought out Dan Haskett, and he, he was the artist who'd done them, and that's honestly how it started. And I can tell you briefly why. This will be quick. When I was a kid, my dad said, always listen to people who are more experienced than you. Notice I did not say older. <laughs> and listen to what they have to say. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dan Haskett, who just took a bite of food, too. <laughs> I, I, actually, I am. Um, one of the very first artists, I, our work that I was introduced to when I first started as an intern at Film Roman was your work. Because um, it, was, it was a show, I don't know if it ever got off the ground, and I wish I had the sketchbook because I still I carried the, that artwork around forever. I, like I saw it at the copy machine and I made a photocopy of, of your work and I'm like, this? this is awesome, this is incredible work, and I had it in my sketchbook forever, um, and I still have it in my but old not, sketchbook. But not in your portfolio. Well, because <laughs> I know for a fact that that has happened to Dan. Oh, no, it wasn't. It wasn't. It, I didn't do that. But um, Indeed but no. It has, yeah. But I had it in, in my sketchbook as inspiration for for a long, a long, long time. So it's actually a really big honor to have, to meet you because you're the one of the biggest. Uh, you, you you were the first uh, really high caliber influential uh, artist that I whose work I saw at a studio. Which totally blew me away. Okay. So, <laughs> thanks very much. So, um, when when did you uh, start? Uh, well, uh, well, let's see. I started professionally in 1969, just out of high school. Oh, right out of high and, school. Yeah, and uh, I just want to give a little mention to that school. It was the High School of Art and Design in New York City. Okay. And it was one of a group of specialized high schools that uh, they now call them the fame schools after that oh, movie. But because uh, uh, the High School of Performing Arts was called the fame school. Oh. And the, the schools have names like uh, uh, Aviation and Bronx High School of Science. And uh, at that time, Music and Art and Art and Design. And uh, Art and Design uh, was really a commercial art. Okay. School. So we had majors like cart besides cartooning and animation, we also had advertising art and uh, illustration, and theater uh, design and uh, fashion design. So, wow. yeah, very very lucky to have come out of there. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. How'd you get into the school? Did you have to apply, or were you, it had, was had just it was in your district? Yeah. Or? Had to take a test. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And bring a portfolio. So, uh, you know, which is a big deal when you're still in junior high school. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's crazy. It's like applying for a job. Yeah, yeah it really was. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. But it was a lovely experience. Wow, oh, wow, I bet. And, uh, and so you entered, what, so after, so you went to school and you were trained as an illustrator or in design or... Well, we, we got as, as well-rounded a, a thing as we could get um, because you did have to have your academics as well. You had to have your math and science and, and English and all that. Of course. But uh, you had art periods that um, took you from like a, a foundation level to whatever major that you chose in your junior year. <laughs> and for me, that was cartooning. Okay. And, and even though it, the school was definitely well set up to do animation, my teacher wasn't an animator. Okay. So I had to bring to it whatever I could, as well as, you know, uh, listen to what he was telling me. Wow. And it was, it was a nice, it was, it was a pretty nice give and take now looking back on it. 
That's fantastic. So, what was your first uh, job? My first job was with Seamus Culhane, uh, oh. who had worked on uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves and had done quite a bit of animation for Max Fleischer, among others. And uh, at the time, he was doing commercials, like everybody else in New York was back then. And I was uh, an all-around everything. I was an in-betweener, an inker, a painter, and a gopher. <laughs> <laughs> Is that because you were so young? And yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you were, you, were, you were the guy, just because it's like... So, uh, so you and Jack Nicholson had the same job at one point then. <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> yeah. did, you, did you know about that? Yeah, he was at, a, bar, at uh, yeah, MGM. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. I remember Ray Patterson, who has uh, passed away now, a friend of mine that was on the original Tom and Jerry crew, had a drawing of... Jack Nicholson as a production assistant on the Howard Bear crew. Wow. Yes, I recall. Was he the one that, <clears throat> was that the drawing where he's labeled Office Boy? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's Jack Nicholson. I don't know who did that sketch. I can't remember. I know, but, it, but it's, it's totally recognizable. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it looks like him. There you go. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else need anything? Doing good. good. Yeah. Good, thank, thank you. You, you want to take a break? You can... Yeah, I'm going to take a little break. I'm glad to see you eating healthy now. <laughs> that thing right. was. And now I can go find one online for 15 bucks. Mm -hmm. And it's a better camera. I'm actually kind of angry about it because now that they won't let me do 2D animation at the big studios. And I can do it. Oh well. Life goes on. So anyway, where are we? <laughs> Complaining about cameras. Um, commercial house. Right. So you were working at commercial houses and you met Grim Natwick. So what kind of commercials were you doing at the time? Oh, well, actually, no, I hadn't met Grim. Oh, uh, not uh, Grim, uh, excuse me. Oh, Seamus. Seamus, yeah. sorry. I can't believe I said Grim Natwick. <laughs> if you guys are listening to this, you can Google that if we don't cut out that big fat mistake I just made. <laughs> anyway, so you're working with Seamus and... Uh, on commercial work, what kind of commercials were you working on at the time? Oh, okay. Well, that f the very first one was for a uh, what was then a new brand of coffee called Brim, and it was uh, <laughs> this was 1969, so it was very psychedelic. <laughs> oh man, very very Peter Max. Did know? that happen when you drank the coffee? <laughs> <laughs> no. I, I I don't know. Maybe that's why it didn't last. I don't know, but. Uh, Okay, in any event, um, I'm trying to think now, I don't remember too much about the other commercials that I worked on. What I do remember is uh, working for a fellow named T. Collins, who was the first uh, black artist that I knew of to have uh, a studio huh. in New York, and he was a designer. Uh, he had been a designer back in the 50s for, I think, Academy Pictures, which at one time, if I remember correctly, it was Bill Titler's place. And uh, So this would have been after he'd been doing the Popeye cartoons? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Bill Titler, <coughs> Disney animator? Right. Yeah, he did right. uh, uh, Chernabog on Night on Bald Mountain, it's one of his biggest claims to fame, and uh, Stromboli. Right. I don't remember what else. Dan does. Oh, Dumbo. <laughs> <laughs> Dumbo, yeah, I've heard of that. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you're saying? But um, I did my first few Sesame Streets around that time uh, when I was working for T. I was doing ink and paint. I, th I think one of the one of the last of the the bunch who actually started in ink and paint. And what I'm, is that? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, but you know, I'm, I'm I'm pretty proud of that actually because um, it did give me some skills that I was able to use for many years after. I remember you telling me when I was learning how to draw after I'd gone to Cal Arts <laughs> that <laughs> <Don't>. <laughs> Ooh, what <laughs> that to think of my pencil as. A brush on vellum and to let it glide across. 
Right. And fortunately, I knew what a cell was because we were still doing some things in ink and paint yes. in the first few years. <laughs> so I knew what you were yeah, talking right. about. Uh, it really wasn't until the mid-90s that ink and paint really started to truly fade away. Right. I think I don't think on the Swan Princess, I think everything was still done. It was still cell. Yeah, it was all cell. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they only did one or two shots, tested a couple of shots on Little Mermaid, right? I think so, yeah, digital. just uh, yeah, <clears throat> some of the end stuff. Like yeah, that. the first digital was um, Rescuers down yeah. there. Boy, that looked weird. Mm. All that funky-looking grain on the gray colors. <laughs> but you could see the potential. I know a lot of people were like, oh, no, it's ink and paint. It's gone away. And at the same time, what came back... Because of the cost effectiveness, you could go back to having colored ink lines like right. on Sleeping Beauty, and but it changed the way people did cleanup. Oh yes. So that didn't Very stay the much. same. Yeah. <laughs> you know, people would take their rough drawings and then a clean, it'd be given to a cleanup artist to do keys, and that line would that those those rough sketches would be turned into a single line, and then an ink and paint artist would take that and ink it onto a clear piece of celluloid, which is you know why we call it cell animation, but when we started doing ink and paint on the computer, that aspect went away. We'd scan the, the cleanup drawings right into the computer, so those cleanup drawings themselves became more and more like ink drawings, and they had to be more accurate for that reason. So when you were doing um, the Sesame Street commercials, do you remember any of the spots that you did at the time? Was this in the, now in the 70s? This is the early 70s, yeah. yeah. So one was called uh, Nancy the Nanny Goat for the letter N. <laughs> and, uh, I remember that. Oh, let me see. <laughs> Do you? Yes. Yeah, you know that. I was watching Sesame Street in the early 70s. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. I won't tell you what year I was born when Dan Haskett <laughs> went to high school. <clears throat> anyway. But uh, you know, I can't, and I can't remember the other one now. That's terrible. But I ended up doing some of my own uh, several years later, and then in the early '80s, mm-hmm. I did five of them. And uh, I just want to say a little bit about that because that was an experience that I haven't had the likes of since. It was so easy to get to to make a film for the children's television workshop. That was called mm-hmm. back then. Now I think it's Sesame Workshop. But uh, there was only one person that you had to worry about. And you came in with your idea, you know, whether it was in script form or storyboard form. And, uh, oh, that's right, before that, uh, you were given a curriculum. You were, you were given a, um, uh, a list of subjects that they wanted to cover that year, huh. that season. And so you were able to make your choice of what you wanted to do from that. And you brought in your idea in board form or script form. And this one lady, whose name was Edith Zorno, looked at it and said yes or no. And they gave you some money, and you left. And you went and you did it. (laughs) Hopefully. And then then you brought it back. (laughs) That was it. Did it you was, film it yourself? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I uh, you know, hired mm-hmm. folks to uh, to film it and uh, do the, some of the uh, ink and paint. So these were all educational. Yeah. So when a cat they, they can't, were like ed- edutainment. So when a cat can't open a, a can of tuna, <laughs> what is the educational aspect? I love that cartoon. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> They had well. Some some things were. Yeah, but, uh, Here's how you doing there. Good. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Refill there. No, I'm good. All right. Thanks. Some things were uh, conceptual, like that. They weren't. Um, the, everything wasn't English and math skills, but uh, uh, conceptual skills, just how to think, how to solve problems. So that's where that. Uh, I think <laughs> mo- most of the things I've not know all of the things I did fell into that category. So that was your way of doing what you wanted. Right. <laughs> <laughs> sure, why not, yeah. So after, uh, after that, did you, how long were you out in New York 
before you came out to California? Did you work there several more years? Uh, or? Okay, well, I'll, I'll have to hop back in time again because uh, I was working, I was actually directing at a studio that was called Teletactics. And that was a, basically, it was a live action studio with an animation mm -hmm. department that did um, low budget commercials and uh, educational films and uh, industrial, you know, uh, commercial, mm -hmm. corporate films. And uh, I did things for uh, the old <coughs> Romper Room show. They were for really for Miles Laboratories, who made uh, Alka Seltzer and, <laughs> and uh, Procter and Gamble. Uh, let's see, that's what the Romper Room stuff is for. Mm -hmm. was Procter and Gamble. And uh, we did several local commercials and things like that for uh, uh, grocery store chains and things like that. They did but animated local commercials? Yes, sir. Not anymore. <laughs> <coughs> I did one in college, but uh, yeah, boy, they don't a, do that another, anymore. Yeah, it was another world. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it really was another world. So we also had a guy that dressed up like Dracula and showed horror movies on the weekends and they don't do that anymore either. So. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was terrific. Uh, the wonderful place to, to cut your teeth, you know. Uh, it was it was crazy making because the budgets were low and everything had to be done with a certain amount of speed, but... But it, you did everything it, it from was, 8 from to 5, right? Every day. Yeah. You never worked late. <laughs> well, I to, to tell you the truth, that's that is pretty much on the mark. Yeah, uh, I think by the time I was about twenty five years old, I said I'm not going to work overtime. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Until I you mean, came out to California. Well, well, no. Here's what happened. I was working on uh, Raggedy Ann and Andy mm -hmm. for Richard Williams, and we had a wonderful assistant animator career assistant named Jim Logan, who was a, a terrific cartoonist all around. And Jim was the kind of person you could set your watch by, because five o'clock, he was out that door. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know? That's it. And I, he was, good night, he was out, he was gone. <laughs> yeah. So, I liked that. <laughs> I liked yep. the idea of that. So, uh, <laughs> aside from other things I learned from Jim, that was a very important thing. <laughs> you mean you don't just, like, live on happiness and drawings and <laughs> rainbows and Everybody sparkles does that. and cartoon Apple animals? Pie and Chevrolet. Uh, <laughs> so, well, I think, I think to an extent, sure, I still do. I think we all do. We wouldn't be here doing it otherwise. Because I don't think any of us drink, so uh, <laughs> we must be doing it for another reason. Occasionally, but not to get a scene done. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, uh, there, there is the, the there are those two sides. There's the uh, you know the, the lollipops and rainbows, and also the uh, five o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a good type of healthy respect for both of them. So, how long you'd been working in the business for what? Uh, six years? Uh, let's see, seven years before Raggedy Ann and Andy? Six years? Uh, let's see, let's see. Yeah, six. I feel like that film's almost a lost movie. You know, it's not played oh, much anymore. Well, yes and no, because some wonderful person who was a Dick Williams fan. Uh, uh, put it up on YouTube, and uh, it's been making the rounds. <laughs> it's it's made the rounds. Um, I don't know. Maybe you know this may be something that I have to cut later. But you didn't put it up there. No, I didn't put it up. There. That's true. <laughs> but uh, it is up there to be seen and appreciated, and I'm very glad that it has been. Uh, it, it's it's kind of amazing looking back on a lot of things that I've done that to see them on YouTube and elsewhere and see these comments hmm. because when you're working on stuff you go oh my god it's horrible it's the worst nightmare I've ever had in my life whatever <laughs> I've started to stop telling people what I thought of the films <laughs> I've worked on uh, because I've had people over the course of the last 
12 months specifically go, I grew up on that movie. Yes. You did that shot? That's right. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to shut my mouth. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's wonderful. It really is. Well, I can and tell you that you know, when I saw Raggedy Ann and, Ann and Andy, I wasn't little. You know, I was little, but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't five. I right, think I was right. eight when it came out, seven or eight. And we'd, we'd gone to see a Charlie Brown uh, feature. And then Raggedy Ann and Andy was coming on. You know, this was, they, they were doing double features. It was late at night. Mm -hmm. And I begged my mother to, to let me stay and watch this because I saw some of the animation and I'd never seen anything like it. It was Disney-esque in its mm -hmm. full animation and quality. You know, of course, looking back on it now, I can look at it and go, I, I can tell that, you know, this scene was handled with care and this right. one was not. Right. Someone cared about this shot and nobody cared about this one. <laughs> that, that being said, uh, it was influential on my becoming an animator because I sought out of it who animated that way. Why does it look that way? Why does it look different than mm -hmm. the, you know, than the... The Charlie Brown cartoon. Right. What, what is it about a Disney cartoon at the time that has some kind of spark of life in it that other cartoons don't? Is it just because of the budget? Well, yeah, well, that's a lot of it, but that's not the only reason. And you and I have had lots of conversations about that in the past. <laughs> but what did you specifically do on Raggedy Ann and Andy? I was a key assistant for Emory Hawkins who was an animator, a golden age animator, who had been just about everywhere, from Disney to UPA to Hubley's to uh, Xander's uh, in New York, Jack Xander's uh, commercial studio. Mm -hmm. And uh, he also had never worked on a feature up to that point. So this was very interesting. Only I, shorts? I, Right, so I had been shorts and commercials, mm -hmm. and I had grown up on Emery's work, you know, among, you know, and several other people who, uh, who worked on that movie. It was a once in a lifetime setup. Uh, it was done in two studios, one in New York, one in LA, and. Uh, it had a who's who of animation talent, including Grim Natwick, Art Babbitt, Emery, Tisa David, uh, Jerry Chinicky, Irv Spence, uh, Willie Pyle, Jack Schnurk. From just from the for, for people from Paramount, Terry Toons, MGM, Disney. Uh, Warner Brothers, all of the, the majors, UPA, you know, everybody was represented. <laughs> I wonder if that'll ever happen again <clears throat> with 2D. I you know, hope so. I hate that term, I 2D. Well, let, let's hand drawn. Yeah, let's say hand drawn. <laughs> traditional, yeah. And I do love both. Don't get me wrong, I've worked on both mediums, but mm -hmm. frankly, there's something about you know, the computer in your head having to figure out how to do it instead mm -hmm. of the computer on your screen, you know, the computer that you're, that you're you know, sitting next to and, well, and putting the data in. But into. it's your first love. I mean, you just don't. <laughs> it's very strange once with all the new, the new animators who just never... Never drawn. Never did the drawing. Does it blow your mind? It's animators amazing. that have never it's drawn. Amazing, yeah. Well, I mean, but stop motion animators never drew either. But they were, they're just as much animators. It's yeah. Just... Well, I'm, yeah, I'm glad that you brought that up because I'm thinking about the whole tactility thing. That um, it is amazing to me that uh, people who have never drawn or never manipulated. Uh, anything by hand are animating and I do wonder if that does make a difference in the mm. quality of the product because I know for me personally I feel like it does make a big difference because it, 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 the, the, the actual feeling of the thing, touching the thing, uh, 
it's something that comes directly out of, it goes from your brain through your fingers, directly. Big difference. Big difference. And, I, and it, it's, it's that kind of, uh, I'll call it an almost intangible, that uh, people are, I don't, are not aware of. That they don't seem to be aware of the importance of it. Yeah, maybe it's psychological, because I mean, you can... Because it's the same thing with a digital drawing versus a drawing on paper. I mean, you're still doing it by hand, and it's still a drawing, but digitally, there's there's still a small disconnect as opposed to when yeah. you do it on yeah. actual. The computer reinterprets what you're doing, <clears throat> and that's important. It does make a difference in the finished product. Yeah. That, that's one reason that I have trouble with Cintiqs. Um, I may eventually work on one, but as long as it still gives its interpretation of my drawing, I'm not thrilled about it. It's, been, it's, t <laughs> it's taken me two years to get used to drawing on my Cintiq, mm. and I still draw better on a piece of paper. But the difference is, I can futz with that drawing a little bit on the Cintiq, and it saves me time because I don't have to scan it. Turn on the computer, scan it, get it in there, format it. So if I'm doing design work, if I'm animating, I gotta anim if I'm animating something mm. on you know hand drawn, I, I'm gonna use paper. Mm -hmm. I just I, I've, I've tried it on the Cintiq. It's just not uh, it's not finessed enough. It's like drawing on a piece of glass. Yeah. Well, it's it's <coughs> like drawing on a piece of glass with a sharpie. Yeah, that's a good that's a good analogy. That's what that's what drawing on Cintiq feels like. But only only depending on the program. The result looks like something out of a brush. <laughs> so it's like it's like three different it's like three different things. Um, so yeah, it's not even a it's not even a sharpie line. It's a brush line, but it feels like it's a sharpie line. It feels like you're drawing mm -hmm. on on glass with a sharpie with a brush line at the end. So it's well, it's definitely not like drawing with a pencil and paper. I wonder if it'll ever be. Mm. I think at some point they're just going to, well, you people with pencils and paper, just get used to it. Well, they have, <coughs> there are some yeah. now with a tooth, with a, with a rough. With a tooth on it? Tooth on it, mm -hmm. and, and the, the Cintiq nibs are now felt tips, so mm -hmm. it feels like a little bit more. You could feel the, the give now, yeah. but still. Well, it's the next a, time it's I go out and spend <laughs> four grand, I'll make sure to go get that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Or should I just buy my paper for, for 20 bucks? <laughs> mm -hmm. hey, you might better if we take a little break. No. Yeah. no, no. Thank you. It'll give me what the other drawing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. For some reason, it's not. It doesn't. Okay. So, after Raggedy Ann and Andy, Dan, did you uh, stay, out, stay in New York? Uh, much longer? Did you decide to come out here? Or? No, not much longer, no. Just uh, about five or so months later, uh, I came out here for the first time to test the waters and then moved out here uh, that summer, summer of 77, um, and uh, went to Disney. And I think I have Dick Williams to thank for that, mm -hmm. actually. Hmm. Uh, I think he, he had, I, I think he had dropped my name to Frank Thomas. Yeah, so thank you very much. Anything else today? Uh, I'm good. That's okay? Refill, okay. anything? No. I'm good. Thank you. I'm good. Thanks. So uh, I believe I do have him to thank for that. Um, and I, just, I mean, most yeah. people who are going to be listening know this, but just so they, so they can put a face to the name, Richard Williams goes back to the 60s and 70s easily um, one of the things he's probably most famous for doing uh, that's still well known is he solidified the look of the current Pink Panther and did the interstitials for Return of the, the did the, the title animation for uh, Return of the Pink Panther and then of course went on and, and uh, did Raggedy Ann and Andy lots of commercial work, I have several friends that have worked with him and um, was the animation director on Frame Roger Rabbit so, so when you when you started at Disney, what was it? What was it like? 
Who did you work with? What did you work on? It was almost literally a three-ring circus. <laughs> uh, Walt was gone. Walt was gone. Walt had been gone for a decade. And uh, the place was trying to figure out what it was going to do. Um, and as, as I understand it, there was a rumor at the time that they were going to close animation down. And so people who were very concerned about this were trying to figure out just what should the studio be doing because another another boot that they got was uh, the success of Star Wars. Huh. Star Wars had just opened, I think, in May of that year. And I got to the studio in July. And so it was the talk of Hollywood. Of course. Wow. And Disney, like several other major studios, had passed on it <laughs> <laughs> when George Lucas came a calling. How ironic. Yeah. Now they own it. <laughs> <laughs> isn't, it isn't it funny how things work out? Yeah. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, at, at, so at the time, people were trying to figure out just what direction the studio was going to take, animation and otherwise, because also family Amazing. films were on the skids, too, because the 70s was, you know, the time of social realism. So uh, that's what, what, you know, which of course made Star Wars a hard sell for Lucas in the first place. Mm -hmm. And Disney was split into three basic factions, it was Walt's people, the uh, CalArts people, the young, you know, the young folks who had just been brought in, uh, some of them while they were still in school, to wow. work there. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, Brad would have been there at the time, right? Mm -hmm. Brad Bird? Yep. Mm -hmm. And then the Don Bluth faction. Oh, right. And Don had been at the studio in, in his teenage years and then uh, left for a while to do uh, missionary work and eventually went through, he went through the TV mill, I think, over at Filmation and then came back. Mm -hmm. and I think he was, you know, he was in and out during that time. Mm -hmm. But he had his own idea of what, what to do and uh, he didn't feel that he could do it and I think, I think he felt his, his wings had been clipped. <laughs> so there you have D it. Dale yeah. has told me a little bit about that time period because uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Dale was yeah, there we, a we, little bit before you were. Yeah, yeah. Right. We, we, we've got his story on this thing too. Like, well, that must his, be pretty good. But yeah. uh, <laughs> we will not talk about that. <laughs> well, but it's recorded. I mean, you. Yeah, but I think that's the part that might be clipped. You know? <laughs> no, it's not. It's, not, it's, not, it's gonna be in there. It's okay. Dale didn't request that. Okay. All right. <laughs> don't, don't mention it again on the podcast. <laughs> and he not only that, but he asked. He, we asked him, and he's like, "No, leave it." <laughs> <laughs> Remember, Dale? That's what they said. <laughs> they said you said that. It's, it's recorded on the podcast. Yeah. So he's saying, he's him saying. So, what was the? Uh, what was, I want to jump back for a, for a okay. bit. Why did you get into animation? What did? What is it that you liked about it? Thought about it? Why didn't you decide to make cars or pizzas? Or I had been drawing cartoons <clears throat> from the time I was three. And that's why I tell people mm -hmm. I didn't find it; it found me. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. And by the time I was 10 or 11, I knew I wanted to do animation. And that was, that's it. <laughs> that's it. I was in the same boat. I, you know, I just, I loved cartooning, obviously still do. And uh, there was something about bringing these things to life and being able to move an audience with these things. I mean, one, one of the, I think for me, one thing that was so much fun about it, uh, cartooning in general was the reaction that people used to have to comic strip characters, newspaper strip characters, uh, where they would actually get so involved with their adventures that they would forget almost that these were not real people. So that that stuck with me. That all that's always been the driving force uh, for me with animation. 
You know, I have to say, I've met some people like that, Dan, that feel that way about animated characters, mm -hmm. and they frighten me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm talking, I'm talking about. But I know what you yeah, mean. Just, I'm talking about what I mean every is a day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, re I remember in, you guys in the anything 60s. Anything else? Any dessert or uh, uh, drinks? I'm good. Anything? Good. Tea, good. coffee. I'm good. Thank okay. you. Good. Thanks. Uh, I remember in the '60s, uh, the, uh, the Dick Tracy strip, when um, Dick Tracy's uh, son married uh, a space alien <laughs> <laughs> called Moon Maid, and the the newspaper was deluged with gifts and and cards and <laughs> well wishes. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So and we're not, we're, you know, we're not talking about, uh, you know, people who make a living from that. I mean, you know, I, I mean, just average, everyday folks who just loved these characters so much. I mean, it, you know, it's a similar thing. I remember it was a, a soap opera actress named Eileen Fulton, I think her name is, who was playing a villain in a very, very popular daytime soap opera. And she told the story of, of uh, a woman walking up to her on the street and slapping her in the face. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. And saying, you know, you, you so-and-so, whatever. So, yeah. Uh. <laughs> Those are the people that I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the idea of being able to move people with these uh, drawings is very, very attractive. It's very wonderful. And I, I sometimes wonder now if in the rush of the new technologies and people having to, you know, to, people getting you know, used to those and spending a lot of time getting used to them because they change so much. If, uh, thank you. If something hasn't been lost, you know, if, if I, I, I wonder if people fully realize what they're able to do. You know, I wonder, I know that there is a, for lack of a better term, I'll say this because we mentioned it earlier, it was not my, I mean, I like it, but it was not my bag. Star Wars, mm -hmm. I think every generation has its Star Wars. Yeah. Mine wore a fedora and had a bullwhip, though. So, I like Star Wars, but mine came a few years later. Um, I wonder what it's like for people today. What is going to be the next Star Wars? And I don't mean that from a business standpoint. I mean that from a cultural standpoint. Mm. You know, what film is going to impact an audience, and, and they're going to carry it with them? You know, The Little Mermaid, obviously, is a big one, which mm. you worked on. Mm -hmm. And you were a designer on, as well. Right. Um, not, you know, a lot of people within the business know this, but you did a lot of the uh, look and initial designs of Ariel, and even after Glenn Keane took that character and made it his own, I mean, you look at your original sketches and drawings and you can tell where the development of that character came from, and the same thing with Belle from Beauty and the Beast. Um, and that's a, that's a funny thing about hand-drawn animation is when someone takes on someone else's work, it, you know, it takes on their bent, it takes on that that change in it, and, and there is a certain aspect of it that is um, communal artwork, kind of, in a way, in some instances. And you kind of riff on each other's work. Yeah, which it's you know it's not, if you're doing a, if you're doing a comic strip, it's not not so much unless you're hired to take on you know a, a comic strip and carry it forward after someone else is retired or they or they you know share a strip or something like that. It's a little different. But what, do you think that there's a disconnect today? Do you think that films come and go more quickly? Not just from the standpoint of the way they've been released, which is true. You know, a film gets in and out of the theaters much faster. You know, I remember when Star Wars came out and when um, Indiana Jones came out, they were in the theaters for months and months. Now, a film's a big hit, it's going to be in the theater for only a certain amount of time, no matter what, no matter if it's big or small. Do you think, how do you think that affects how audiences pick up and become attached to characters in film? Good question. I think that home video 
may have created its own niche that way because now that people can actually buy a movie and, and hold on to it and watch it whenever they want to, if it's something that they really love, um, it may not have the cachet of an event like it used to. But it there, there just may be the same kind of attachment now, or the same kind of sentiment, I'll say, for a movie that people you had with books. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I was thinking exactly that. That it was, it's, it's a lot more like, like the book experience. Um, but the, pro the thing is, the, the a film requires a bigger budget allows for a bigger budget so you get a little bit more spectacle because of the budget but the attachment that you were talking about that used to be given to comic strips are now done to serialized uh, episodic television mm -hmm. uh, which is no longer I mean it's it's no, I mean it's not episodic but serialized television <clears throat> I should say because it's it's yeah. a lot more like what used to be Moby Dick and you know, Dickens and stuff like that, where it used to be serialized and then compiled right. into a big right. book. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what television has become yeah. exactly. in a lot of ways. And, yeah. and it always was. And, yeah, and, and comic strips were like a visual version of that right. for a while. And uh, uh, yeah, so it, because of on demand digital stuff, it's no longer, you don't have to reboot the series every, every week. You can watch it all in one chunk. Yeah, and now you can talk about it with people all over the world. Yeah. You know, in an instant. So uh, that's another factor that um, you know, is something that we, we've never been able to do before. So it remains to be seen the kind of an effect that's also going to have. Mm. What do you think the future is? I don't think I've asked this before. Hmm. I ask, I'll ask Dan because he's... he's lived through so many of the various movements of animation in the, in the, in the new generation, including what is now called the new golden age, you know, kicking off with Roger Rabbit. As people look at that and say that kicked it off. I think it actually started a little before that. Mm -hmm. But what do you think the future of hand-drawn animation is, and specifically theatrical? I think, oh, okay, well, let me tell you a little story. Earlier this year, I went back to New York to give a talk at the School of Visual Arts, and uh, I also went back to my high school, Art and Design. And my high school has been completely changed. Uh, the old building was knocked down, and a new one built on the same site. And I spoke to the cartooning and animation class who are now totally digital and at one point I asked them how many of you would like to do traditional you know to do hand-drawn animation how many of you are interested in doing that most of them raised their hands and that was a lovely surprise because here's the, this room full of 17 year olds who have never known life without digital. And they're curious. So I think that the future of this really depends on how many people who do love it are willing to work from that love and just ignore what else is going on and you say well this is what I love this is what I want to do because uh, you need to just focus on what you enjoy what, what really fires you up and I think once you do that other things will start to fall into place you'll start wanting to do better stories. Uh, you'll start wanting to create characters that have an effect on people. 
you'll you'll want to communicate uh, rather than just sell toys. And I've run into enough young people, enough students who really would like to give this, you know, at least take a crack at this. <laughs> And uh, that's just marvelous to me. If they pull together, you know, and now that they, they actually have with the technology, one of the things that they can use it for mm -hmm. is to support each other. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think the other side of the coin, and this is something that has always lamented me, and I've told you this before, and, and, I'll, and I'll mention this briefly, that I that I uh, always you know, it frustrated me going to the water cooler so to speak and hearing not that it not that everybody complained about everything that's not the case yeah. but going to the water cooler and, and hearing oh this film's terrible or oh this this is how they should do this this they should run this this is where the problems are they should run it this way and very few of those people that were talking in that way have the guts to put their money where their mouth was and start a business. I wish that in the artistic and film community that Business 101 was a requirement before you could graduate. Yeah. That is the one thing I wish was, was different mm -hmm. because it, it's empowering. If people know how to run a business, it empowers them to be able to do it. Yeah, and you, you might suggest yeah. that... Uh, yeah that young artists do exactly that. If their schools don't offer it, to take a course elsewhere, mm -hmm. you know, or, or you know, pick up a book, <laughs> or, or order an e-book, you know, yeah. and do it. Um, yeah. Well, okay, J to jump back, mm -hmm. I don't know how much longer you've got, but we'll, we'll try Let's to... See. I've got a little bit. Okay, yeah. well, to jump, to jump back in time again, back at, back at Disney, so what was, it, what, what was the first project you worked on there, and what were some of the projects that you enjoyed and had a real influence on? Okay. The first project was called The Small One, and it was a Christmas half hour um, that I think is you know, probably still come, maybe still comes out on home video at Christmas time. I mean, Did Bluth direct that? Uh, let's... Did he do it then? Yes. Yes, that was... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was his thing, yeah. Um, the second one was The Fox and the Hound. And, uh, after that, we'll see, I left the studio during that and came back ten years later for uh, Little Mermaid. And when you started on the Little Mermaid, what was the what was that what we brought in to do? Character design. Character design. Yeah. So you were designing Ariel, right. and uh, did you touch every character? Just some yeah. of the characters touched every character. That that's it's a common thing with designers, or a common thing with development artists, or just to touch everything, or was it just unique to the uh, position or, or or that time? Depends. It, it's it's flexible. It's completely flexible. You know, it just really depends on where you are and you know what the film is at the at the moment, really. Because some things you'll be designing all the characters, others you'll be brought in as a specialist. For you know, sometimes some things I've been brought in on because uh, I do ethnic characters. Mm. Uh, but it's you know some it's character design is, has been a very informal, like, like a lot of other things in animation, mm -hmm. it's been very informal because it, your characters have been desi designed by story artists, by directors, by okay. animators, you know, and by specialists. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. If you were to uh, advise anybody, because, I mean, that's really interesting, it just, it just occurred to me, if you were advised to... Any advice to a student who wants to get into the animation industry? 
or is working already, uh, what would be uh, something that you would say to them now, as opposed to before? But like, how have has conditions changed? Uh, oh, I don't think conditions have changed that much. Okay. Uh, I would still say live. You know, get out and and. and meet people, learn from people, travel, uh, build yourself up culturally. The, the thing that I fear is because of the emphasis on the technology mm -hmm. and that that technology is changing constantly, 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 I'm concerned that there will never be a quiet time, you know? That, that's what worries me, is that there won't be a time for people to just sit back the, and really feel and think mm -hmm. about what they do. Mm -hmm. You mean it's because there so much so much media is absorbed all so the time? So much media is absorbed and also the constant having to relearn, having to learn new software again and again and again that's got to be taken away from people's just your ability to concentrate you know I agree with you but I, but I recall my dad was a fireman and he told me he said son you gotta go to school every five years you're gonna go back to school and you're, if you're at your job you're gonna end up going back to school even if it's at your job you're going to be learning something because things are going to change how you do things and I and I didn't really didn't really click with me until several years ago as you know I've been working in the film industry how that really is true within our industry of course because of the technology is generally it has to be the cutting edge to be able to bring it to the media so of course we're gonna get hit hardest in a way but every job you remember we did a podcast a while back saying don't stop learning mm -hmm. so there is that aspect but I, but I know what you mean you but, have to learn the software yeah. just to be able to draw a character well, but mm -hmm. what, what I, to manipulate or right. make the movie you have to learn this new software what it seems to me <clears throat> that you're saying Dan is not it's not that you shouldn't be learning so much as you should learn to be without necessarily being connected, without necessarily being distracted from just contemplating who you are, where you're at, and just be able to, to be quiet, mentally in your mind yeah. and, in, and, in, and in your, and, and then yeah. deal with life, the fact that you're, you're alive and you're living and, and, and maybe even contemplate the the scary stuff that you're trying to distract yourself from by being online all the time or checking your email or... or yeah. a, f a friend of mine has a daughter who I think is uh, two, she two years old, two or three years old. Um, and he documents her uh, adventures in cartoon form. <laughs> It's the best thing he's ever done. <laughs> uh, it's absolutely marvelous. And, yeah, I'm, I'm, that, that's what I mean is what I'm seeing with a lot of art, what I've always seen with uh, animation artists is more and more they, they, they seem to be getting away from actually feeling anything about what they do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Almost you know, like pulling it out of a hat. Right, here's my bag of tricks. I'll walk in. I'll do... Not that everybody does this, yeah. but there, yeah. there could be an aspect. I know there is for me sometimes. You know, you get dry, a dry spell, but you still got to pay rent. Yeah, yeah. And you do have to use your bag of tricks. That's mm -hmm. true. What I mean is, though, that... <clears throat> It seems that even, you know, go, people just coming into the field, people going into it now, don't really get the value of feeling. They, they're, they're very hung up on how things look and, you know, making sure that they have the, that, that they have the latest style. 
down pat. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very, very much concerned with what other artists think of them, which is, you know, and of course, is what, what, what young people will do anyway, but the, th um, the, the, the advent of things like DeviantArt and Tumblr and, and other websites where artists are com comparing each other so early is worrisome, I think. I think that also can spawn, it can be good and it can be bad. Yeah. The good is you can get your stuff out there immediately. Right. You can self-publish. Right. Right. The bad, you're immediately comparing yourselves to people that have 25 years of experience. Well, and you're, you're, you're immediately and you're constantly comparing. Yeah. And then you can also turn that into a feeding off. Well, that's how they draw. I learn how to draw the way that they draw. And yeah. then my stuff starts looking like their stuff. And I don't go out and ever just draw from life. I don't ever and, soak know, it in. I'm, I'm constantly drawing something based on someone else's something that's based on someone else's something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there's, there's no joy in that. And uh, I, I do wonder when I, when I, when I talk to students... They're very, very nervous. And it goes beyond just the thing of being young and inexperienced. There, there's, there's something sinister. <laughs> there's something that, that feels sinister to me that's at work that uh, is leading them away from themselves. Hmm. You know? It, it's taking them away from finding out what kind of people hmm. they are artistically I don't hear I don't hear I know, now, you know I don't put myself in the position to hear it but I don't know if there's a lot of uh, discussion about the art side of anything with this anymore I don't know I, I, I had friends who were dying to have something like some equivalent of a La Belle Epoque set up where they, you know, they, they would be in cafes talking about art and, and <laughs> with a capital A, you know, and politics and uh, events of the day. I think that's always been missing from Los Angeles. Yeah. Maybe not. Maybe, maybe so. Maybe not always, but I think it, yeah, I think it disappeared. Yeah. <laughs> because we are all, we're on our cars. You know, it's not it's not a small yeah. town. It's everything spread out. Yeah. So it it does make a big difference. It really does. So again, on the flip side, there is that aspect of digitally. Mm. You can go to forums, and you can have discussions. You can, and that and that does help. What it's I've not also tactile. heard, yes. What I've also been hearing from people who have, been, you know, brought up on that, uh, is is uh, that they don't. Okay. Uh, again, when I was in New York recently, I was talking to the two ladies who run Asifa East, and at the time they were upset because they were not able to get people away from their computers to come out to any events. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody was working so hard, you know, and they were so involved with, you know, making deadlines or, uh, you, know, other, you know, otherwise getting their stuff done that they, you know, they, they, they wouldn't leave. <laughs> They, they didn't come outside. Well, uh, th and, and since since then, fortunately, look, it looks like it, it is changing. Okay. So that's good. Well, that but that's not actually the fault of of the, the the technology. It's more of the fault of the curriculum, right? Or no? I think that the technology has, you know, it, it has, as Larry was saying, it has its good points as as well. But I think that the bad points have been overlooked to a degree. Hmm. Because again, it's so new and, and people are so interested and there's this big rush and there's a big push to embrace it as well. 
And I think that people forget. It comes back to bite them, you know, <laughs> eventually. But I do think that people forget. Uh, and with animators especially, they, they've, they've been prey for a long time to what I, what I used to call the 12 field mentality, which is <laughs> you're, you're involved in this little square right in front of your face for eight hours a day. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, another curious thing I, I've been seeing lately is uh, people really not talking to each other. Mm -hmm. you know, and I'm, I'm guilty of that myself. That they're, they're, they're not they're not hanging out around the water cooler anymore. You know. Well, I, I know in part it, it, at, the, at uh, my studio, part of that is uh, just deadlines have gotten crazy, yeah. and yeah. and they've the the no, shows no, got, much more complicated, so it's a little bit trickier. Well, yeah. The deadlines are insane because people have no idea of how long it takes to do anything. And they don't ask. <laughs> and they don't care. You know. I think, I, yeah, they don't ask because they don't care. They just want it. Well, and also people don't tell them how long it takes. Yeah. Uh, I think people are afraid to tell them how long it takes. And that's very sad. But the upside again to all this is, I think, that if you get enough people together who feel a certain way, that they can create something new. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not even think, talking about turning the tide anymore. I'm just thinking about throwing out the whole thing and starting from scratch. The technology is here and it's not going to go away. And it has to, you have to figure out how to use it the best way. Mm -hmm. Well, now that you can self publish, mm -hmm. you know, if you've got the desire and the time to do a cartoon <clears throat> and the resources, whether that's money or friends or just your own time on your own, you can do something and get it out there. Right. And, and, and that's unique. That's oh, yeah. never, it's never been like that before. No. no. It's changed everything. It's changed how things are made, distributed, and marketed. Mm -hmm. It's changed the whole ball game. Yeah. It's, empowered, it, it's yeah. empowered the individual more mm -hmm. than anything else. Yeah. The, my, I would add to, uh, to that, actually. I, I, I would ask, um, don't you think that's already... That, that is kind of happening already, like the whole er, throwing everything out and starting over. It's kind of what's already happening. It's going to be almost like a generation or, or two or 10, 20 years. It's like, for example, 2D may come back again full throttle, but it'll be reinvented by a completely different generation who didn't work within the parameters of the old generation and yeah. because they've reinvented how to do it or reinvented at least the st structural way to, to, to produce it not mm -hmm. necessarily the art form in and of itself but the way it's produced right. because CG has taken over and yes. 2D is technically is dead as far as the commercial feature the feature animated yeah, uh, yeah feature For animated now. Animated movies. Two yeah. D is still alive and well in television, and and in, and people are animating on individually, uh, but at least in the, in the U S. because in Japan there's two D feature, yeah. and in Europe there's two D feature, but um, in the U S. it's kind of well. Remember too, it's it's this way because we let it happen. We just we just let it happen. <laughs> yeah, and we were told, you know, there's no studio yeah. head that's come up and said, "I want to be a filmmaker." No, they 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 for the most part, movie studios are not run by movie makers, you know, and not that that yeah. there's always been that aspect, of course. There's always yeah. you know, but in I'll just be specific. In Walt Disney's case, here was a guy who wanted to do art who wanted to be a storyteller and an animator 
and his studio came out of that love and enjoyment, and of course it's affected the whole fabric of mm -hmm. entertainment. Yeah, I mean, and we don't have that aspect to the to that degree today, as far as someone coming in and and having a big venue with a big studio that's putting product well, like yeah. that out there. Yeah, yet, yet, yeah, but yeah, because now you've got the ability to self distribute. You finish something, put it up on YouTube, you get a hit immediately. You know, you can go to directly to Netflix. You can go directly to Hulu. Now, what's going to happen is these companies are going to be bought by the big guys eventually, but that isn't going to make all the other outlets go away, something right. else is going to pop up right. in its place. Yeah. And I can tell you from, you know, my personal uh, film, what I'm working on right now, you know, yes, we're doing CGI, but I'm going to do the end credits 2D. Mm -hmm. You know, why not do both? Not just one, <laughs> but have both in there and, and see what happens. They're two very different animals, although there's a lot of, a lot of like thinking between the two. You know, 2D and, or hand-drawn and computer-generated animation are very different animals. Now, my experience has been from the standpoint of, of those two aspects that traditional animators who really took to doing computer animation, mm -hmm. their work generally, there's something that's just a little different in their work than someone who has come up and only done Computer generated animation has never touched tactile, has never, you know, mm -hmm. taken life drawing, has never, you know, sat down and figured out how to draw the head in different human head in, in different angles. There's there's something different about it. Yeah. And there's something there's a quality that, that that is different. I won't say it's better because there are some fantastic digital animators out there. But there is something different about it. So likewise, going back to the whole business comment, you look at the medium of animation as a whole, both digital and traditional, and the ability to uh, put your own stuff out there. Mm -hmm. Those two things have never been a part of anyone's world until this generation. It's never happened mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. You have to go to the gatekeeper at, at the newspaper if you wanted to get your cartoon published. Otherwise, no one is ever going to see it because way back when you couldn't even copy it. It was, here's my original, and no one else is ever going to see it, because there was no such thing as a Xerox machine. You didn't have a camera at home that you could take a picture of, much less being able to scan something or take a picture of it and immediately send it out to some, some post board where thousands of people could immediately see it 30 seconds after you put it into your computer. Right. And so, Dan, where's your studio? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have a couple of folks who are after me right now to do just that. And uh, also, I am finally putting together my artwork for a book. Oh, finally? You want yeah. some of the originals back? <laughs> <laughs> I've got a stack about that at home. Uh, I, I, I've got about 40 <laughs> years worth in storage, wow. so yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, I think it is finally going to happen, and uh, I'm very happy about it. So, um, we'll, we'll wrap it up here in a moment. Um, after Disney, you worked on Beauty and the Beast and Little Mermaid. I met you at Warner Brothers um, before Beauty and the Beast, wasn't it? Yeah, because I was at I was I started at Disney on Prince of the Pauper. Yeah, it was around the same time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and speaking of Warners, I have a big folder of just your Tiny Toons stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so do it's I. It's like this thick. <laughs> oh my goodness! It's just a big monster of just tiny <laughs> tune that has But I was there when he was drawing it. <laughs> <laughs> I got a photocopy, right? <laughs> <laughs> so you went on. You get re really influential on on uh, tiny tunes and the whole rebirth of Warner Brothers Animation. You were highly influential on. Um, what have you been doing lately? What stuff have you been working on? What have you been enjoying working on? What's coming up that you can mention? Well, I'm actually back at Warner Brothers. I've been there for about uh, four years now. Four or five, almost five. And I've been working on Scooby-Doo and Tom and Jerry. 
ironically enough, I'm one of the last people there working on paper. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm also one of the last people there to be animating traditionally. Wow. Um, happily, I have a wonderful director who is an animator himself and who just adores animating. So, I get the chance, and uh, other character layout people get the chance to actually animate scenes now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in the middle of all this, yeah, of, of, of mm -hmm. what we've been talking about. Yeah. I worked on a couple yeah, of those are. Tom and Jerry's. Mm -hmm. so. Well, anything you want to tell anybody before? Of the new, of, before? Of the new t the stuff yeah. that he's working on? I worked on the Robin Hood one. And I worked on, uh, what was the other one I did? What was the one before that? Before the oh, Robin Hood, Tom and Jerry. Uh, I did, Wizard I did of some Oz? Spy, yeah, Wizard of Oz, that's what it was, because I did some Toughy mm -hmm. on that. I did yeah, some Toughy. Okay. And then on the, on, the, on the Tom and Jerry meet Robin Hood, I did... I did Jerry mm -hmm. and Spike, and mm -hmm. Spike, which is funny because Ray Patterson, whenever there was Spike to do, Ray Patterson would do Spike. Uh, he was always yeah. given the Spike animation. Huh. <laughs> anyway, any, any other suggestions for your fans? Anything you want to say to animation fans or, or wannabe professionals or those who are coming up through the ranks that you haven't already said? Mm. I would just say just remember to love it. And if you, if you ever run into anything that makes you doubt that you love it. Uh, Give you a call? 555. <laughs> <laughs> five, five. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would just say to, uh, if it's not fun anymore, then let it go. Find something not immediately. <laughs> like if you have a couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying that makes just just um, make sure that you enjoy yourself with this, you know, as much as you possibly can. Uh, don't let yourself get snowed under <laughs> by all of the rigmarole that goes on with the business. And I know it's very difficult, but it is doable. <laughs> Thank you, Dan, for, for coming and talking with us. And this is, like, we didn't even really even talk about, like... We could easily every, do two we more. We could do, like, two or three more. The same thing with Dale's It's interviews. amazing. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of blown. We didn't even talk about Simpsons. We didn't... Uh, there's just so much... Oh my gosh! Um, thank you so much for me. For uh, I'm, I'm starting to gush. Um, thank you for so much. Um, Do you want me to close the sound? Yes, please. <laughs> I know Dan Longer, and I know all of some of his faults and stuff. He's not. He's really not that good. <laughs> I'm lying. I'm jealous. Anyway, Dan, again, thanks for coming out and uh, visiting with us and for recording another episode of The Corner Booth with us. And for everybody who's listening, we'll see you next time at The, the Corner, Corner Booth. Booth. But we shouldn't we shouldn't be uh, talk about our, our site. Oh, yeah. That's a good point. Thank you for listening to The Corner Booth again. If you'd like to visit us, you can see us on... Cornerbooth.net Or... iTunes. Or... I don't know. Facebook. Facebook. <laughs> don't forget to go to Facebook and like us. We will continue to post articles and stories about animation. Again, thank you, Dan Haskett, for joining us. We really appreciate you spending time with us. Do you have, Dan, uh, a website or anywhere uh, that you could yet? I'm setting up a Facebook page, though. Okay. Okay, good. Um, if you'll do another interview, I'll help you. <laughs> <laughs> And Larry, do you have anywhere they could you could be reached online? Yes, you can check out Ghost Train Pictures. And, um, of course, you can see my personal stuff on LarryWhitakerProductions.com. But Ghost Train Pictures on Facebook. And uh, soon we'll have our Ghost Train Pictures website up. So until next and, uh, time, well, and then, uh, yeah, we'll use you, the drawing website. Yeah, you could, I have uh, the drawingwebsite.com. You can go to that one. You can go to LuisEscobarBlog.com. You can go to the DrawFu group on Facebook. You can join us there. And uh, and I'm Twitter. I'm Luis 
uh, underscore E underscore Escobar on Twitter. And I'm also on Google+. Plus. Oh, and and it, it, I have a Facebook page. And also. if you do visit us on Facebook, we will reply until we have 25,000 fans. That's where we're going to cut it off at. <laughs> so, until next time, we'll see you at The, the Corner, Corner Booth. booth.